Well, thank you, Tommy. Thank you, choir. And on the harp today is Anne Meredith Fry, the daughter of Cham and Sylvia, members of our church. And we're grateful for Anne and her family being with us today. Take your Bible, if you will, and turn to the book of Psalms, chapter 32. We're looking at selected Psalms. And make your plans to be here tonight. I tell you, both messages have really ministered to me. And tonight, if you want to save time, I can guarantee you tonight will be a time-saving message for you as you come back tonight. Well, let's stand together and turn to Psalms chapter 32, and I'll begin in verse 1. We don't know if this was before or after David's sin with Bathsheba, but it's a sin of forgiveness. I'm going to preach on the joy of forgiveness. Psalms 32 verse 1. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, thy hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledge my sin to thee and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and thou didst forgive the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to thee in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not reach him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou dost preserve me from trouble. Thou dost surround me with songs of deliverance. By the way, the reason I'm pausing, when you see a sailor there, that's what you're supposed to do. Think about it for just a second. And that's hard for me to stop when I'm preaching in pause, I guarantee it. Verse 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise, they will not come near to you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. But he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. Thank you, you may be seated. Well, I want to preach this morning on this subject, the joy of forgiveness. And every single one of us need that. I want you to notice in verse 1 of chapter 32, there are two words there, same word used twice, the word blessed. Now, let me ask you a question. How many, let's see how sane you are this morning. How many people want to be blessed this morning? Raise your hand. That means joyful and happy. Well, everybody that has any common sense wants to be happy. And he says, one of the ways that you find happiness is through forgiveness. Two were debating one day. It was the American Psychological Association annual meeting. And one by the name of Hobart Mauer said that man needs to confront his sin psychologically to be well. Albert Ellis said, no, never mention sin, never get guilty, because when you're guilty, you do damage for your, to yourself. Well, of the two, Hobart Mauer was right. The only way that a person can really find joy and peace is through forgiveness. Now, what is forgiveness? Forgiveness is not the erasing of the past. Can't do that. Forgiveness is God's accepting my past and a change of relationship to my past such that I am redeemed or set free from my past. And all of us need forgiveness today. I'm going to speak this morning about forgiveness, knowing that healthy benefits are available for those receiving true forgiveness. I want to mention about some benefits this morning. And what are the blessings of forgiveness? Number one, write it down. There is release from guilt. When you're forgiven, you have release from guilt. Now, let me mention why you need release from guilt. Notice, if you will, in verse one, he mentions transgression. The word means rebellion. All of us have rebelled against the authority of God. Notice in verse 1, the word sin. That means to miss the mark. He's drawing a graphic picture of why we need forgiveness. When you shoot an arrow and you miss the mark, your behavior is not good enough. And then verse 2, iniquity means moral crookedness. That's what Enron and WorldCom are, are facing today. That's when you, you misconstrue the books and you, you juggle the books of your life and you don't give proper accounting before God. And in verse 2, last phrase, the word deceit means insincerity. I go before God, I don't come clean with God. And so transgression and sin, iniquity, insincerity, deceit, all those things are part of every life here today. You see, the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I don't know about you, but I, I hope I'm not the only one here. Every one of us 
has got some sin that we deal with really daily. And because of that, he says, you need forgiveness. Now, when I do not get forgiveness, something happens to me. Look in verse 3. I have guilt that comes into my life. What is guilt? Guilt is the abridging of the moral code of my life. That means I have a standard of ethics in my life. This is right. But my behavior is down here. And the gap between my behavior and my standard is the guilt factor. And you see, guilt weighs heavily on you and me. That is, knowing I've done something wrong, but there's no release from that. And there are four results of that. Number one, when I have unresolved guilt, there is physical ramification. All kind of ramifications. For example, notice in verse 3, he said, my body wasted away. That is, it affects you physically. Psalm 6 in verse 2, he says, be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am pining away Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are dismayed. Medical doctor S.I. McMillan says that guilt can keep the blood from flowing to your bones, such that your bones aren't operating correctly. And then verse 7 of Psalm 6, my eye has wasted away with grief. It has become old because of all my adversaries. That is physically, your vitality is lessened. Look in verse 4 of chapter 32 of Psalms. He says, my vitality was drained away as with a fever heat of summer. Have you noticed it was, it's hot lately? Have you noticed that? Uh, some of you look like you've lost your vitality. I mean, you know, uh, and guilt will do that. It will take away your physical vitality. But notice second of all, it will affect you emotionally. There's emotional stress. Look in verse 3. He has problems sleeping now. He says, my groaning all day long. That's an emotional stress. And then verse 4, day and night thy hand was heavy on me. It affects you emotionally. That is, you can't operate the way that you should operate. And you can't smile and emote physically and emotionally to others around you. And then number three, there's a relationship disturbance. Uh, when I have an emotional and physical ramification, it affects my connection with God and my relationship with other people. I can't relate. That's what happened to Adam and Eve. When they sinned, they hid from God. And their relationship with God had a break. And then they played the game, blame game. And Adam said, she made me do it. And there was a relationship break between Adam and Eve. And so it'll affect you emotionally and it will keep you from connecting with others. CBS several years ago came out with a report on a man by the name of Paul Reed. Paul Reed was a Vietnam veteran. He came back from Vietnam. He said, my job was to kill there. I killed a lot of people. And he said, deep down, I hated myself. He had guilt. And he came back, hated the, the North Vietnamese, and he couldn't relate to his wife, went from one marriage to another, one job to another. His son Silas was estranged from him. But when he came back from Vietnam, he brought some paraphernalia, which included a diary of a North Vietnamese soldier. He couldn't read the diary. But he noticed the name, and he connected the name with a man now in Vietnam who was still alive. He went back to Vietnam, and he ran into Nhan Van Nguyen. I'm not pronouncing that right. It's Nguyen Van Nguyen or something like that. Anyway, he found him. And, and he went into his house, and, and they sat there, and they compared notes. And one said, Nguyen said, you know, I forgive you. I'm blinded from my Vietnamese experience. I can't see, but he said, I forgive you. And Paul Reed said, well, I forgive you. And Paul Reed came back from Vietnam, the CBS correspondent reported, documented, came back a different man. Now he could relate to people. Now his son and he were connected again. No longer did he hate the North Vietnamese. In fact, he with some other veterans got Mr. Nguyen and brought him back. And with eye therapy, now the Vietnamese man can see. But more importantly, Paul Reed could see because now he could connect with other people. You see, without forgiveness, there's relationship disturbance. And then fourthly, there's a self-confidence that's affected. You see, if you're not walking forgiven, you can't walk with confidence. You don't trust yourself. You don't trust God. You don't trust others. And many a young person has left home without self-confidence because of guilt. Number five, this is not on your outline, but number five, there's a spiritual disturbance when you have guilt. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul mentions forgiveness three times in verse 10. And then verse 11 he says, In order that no advantage be taken of, a, by us, of us by Satan, for we're not ignorant of his schemes. 
there is a satanic level, listen carefully, that when I do not receive forgiveness and I don't forgive you, I put myself on the same level as demonic oppression in my life. And you see this morning, listen carefully, this morning there can be some people that are totally released from this guilt because guilt will weigh you down and the benefit is I lose that strong weight of guilt in my life. Number two, the second benefit is this. Not only release from guilt, but there's connection with God. Connection with God. Now notice if you will, you got your Bible open. Notice chapter 32 and verse 5. He said, I acknowledge my sin to thee. And notice what happens when he did this. Verse 6, first phrase. Therefore he said, let everyone who is godly pray to thee in a time when thou may be found. That is confession, write it down, confession produced connection. Confession produced connection. Now, the two ways to connect with God, one, when you're saved, you connect with God. Well, you can lose the fellowship connection with God because of guilt, because of sin. And so he goes before God and he confesses to God. Now, now this is not a practice that we do a lot today. Uh, confession comes hard. Tell me, what is confession? Confession is simply agreeing with God about my sin. But that's hard to do because we justify our sin. We rationalize, we say well, everybody else is doing it. I have my rights, don't I? After all, it's only a small, little bitty sin. And small things don't mean much, oh no. Try going to bed with a mosquito all night and see how a small thing affects you. Maybe a small thing in your life. But you see, a small thing, as 1 Corinthians chapter 5 says, a little leaven affects the whole loaf. And maybe you say, well, preacher, you know, the truth of the matter is, I don't have the vitality in my Christian life that I once had. There's something missing. It may be several reasons, but one reason may be there may be something in your life that God is putting on your heart that you need to confess. You know what it might be? It may be somebody who's offended you that you've not forgiven. You see, that will keep you from experiencing the joy of God. I want to tell you something. I was at 5.30 in the morning lying in bed going over some names that came to my mind. Now, I didn't ask that to happen, but it just did. Uh, some people that God was reminding me that I personally need to forgive. Maybe I hadn't done it before, but I want, I want you to know before I preach to you, I want to get it straight. So maybe that sin in your life that needs to be confessed is that simply you need to forgive someone who's done something to you. It brings connection with the Almighty. Now, let me say this quickly to you. If you have unconnected from God, disconnected from God, God's always ready to reconnect with you. I remember David when David wrote this song, when David was walking with God and things were going well and chapter 7 of 2 Samuel, Nathan goes up and he talks to Samuel, tells him what God's saying. And then in chapter 11, David commits adultery with Bathsheba and commits murder with Uriah. After that, Nathan comes again in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 9, and he says, why have you despised the word of the Lord? You have refused to listen to God's word. And then David says, all right, and he confesses to God. He said, I've sinned against the Lord. And he confesses to God and he reestablishes contact with God. And I'm going to tell you something very honestly though. I trace the chapters after chapter 12 of 2 Samuel. It takes him about five chapters to reconnect with God. It was like swimming through muddy water. His sin was so grave, he had to forgive himself and come back to God. I'll tell you something else though. He didn't have Jesus like we do. And you can reconnect today. If you've disconnected from God, you can connect back with God and walk with God. And guess what happens when you do that? Listen carefully. When you connect with God, suddenly you connect with other people. And you begin to connect with your wife and your husband and your children. And maybe there's a disconnect this morning. In Cherokee County and two years ago in the newspaper, two ladies were reported sitting on the front porch. The suburban... Uh, Mrs. Butler began to roll down the yard. Mrs. Ward's two four-year-old twins were playing. It took a sharp right turn, rolled into the yard, and ran over one of those twins and killed him instantly. The next day, Mrs. Butler, the owner of the Suburban, came back, deep grief in her heart for Ms. Ward had lost her child. And she said, I went up to the door to somehow comfort her. And Ms. Ward came out and she said, you must feel terrible about your car killing my child. And she embraced her and forgave her as if there were something to forgive. And the paper reported that since that time, these two families have gotten together, eaten together, close friends together. 
And Mrs. Butler, whose car killed the child, said, you know, this is the most godly woman I've ever met. Now, the paper didn't tell you why, but I imagine Jesus is connected with that situation some way. The paper didn't say that. But you see, when Jesus forgives you, you're able to forgive and connect with others. It gives you the benefit of a connection with God. Notice number three, the third benefit is this. There is direction from God. After confession, there's connection. After connection, there's direction. Now, just follow the script. I didn't write it. Look in chapter 32 and verse 8. He says, I will instruct you and teach you. If five of you come to my office this week for counsel, I guarantee four of you can ask this question. You're going to say, preacher, my question is, how can I know what God wants in my life? What is God's will for my life? I gave one of those books out this week. I'm always giving that book out. It seems like how to find God's will. People want to know what's God's will. Let me tell you something. There's no way to find God's will until you go through the maze of this progress diagram I'm describing today of forgiveness and confession because you can't connect with God. But when you connect with God, you begin to hear God. Look in verse 8. He said, I will counsel you with my eye upon you. I will give you direction in your life. A young pastor left a skating rink in a rural pastor with some children one night. He noticed the blue light special flashing behind him. The policeman walked up. He said, sir, you just ran a stop sign. He said, how could I run a stop sign? I didn't see it. He said, of course you didn't see it. Your lights are off. The bewildered pastor looked down, pulled his light switch, and sure enough, his lights were out. And the policeman said, the reason you didn't know your lights were out is your window was fogged. Sure enough, it was fogged. He couldn't see out. The policeman let him go. But later, the young pastor remembered Matthew 5, verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And you see, it's when that fog of sin is released from your own life that you have a connection with God and you see God and God directs you in the way. Now, how many here today, let me know, I mean, how many here today have some decision you're warring with, something you want to know about? Just raise your hand. Might be the stock market. Might be your job. Might be your children. Most of us want to know. He says, here's the promise. But he says, verse 9, if you're going to have verse 8, don't be like a mule or a horse which have no understanding. Don't be stubborn. Look at that sin and deal with that sin. I want to tell you something today. Uh, that there's an element of worship that we don't do much that we used to do. And that's celebrating sin. And by celebrating, I mean recognizing that sin is in my life. I need confession for that sin. And many times I'm broken that sin and I release that sin. And then there's celebration of that sin. I, I can't think of a time in this church in seven years, I can't think of many times that somebody was so broken for their sin, they came down and hit this altar. And that's not this church, it's our culture. I can tell you multiple times in previous 25 years of preaching in our culture and others, when people literally come down and weep and cry over sin. I had a lady came down the aisle one day and confessed murder during the invitation. I'm talking about brokenness over sin. And that's what we need to find God. And many today don't have the direction of God because they're not recognizing they're like a mule or a horse. But the promise is when I get forgiven and when I confess, I get released from guilt, connection with God. And listen, direction from God. Don't you want direction from God? Don't you? Say amen. I know you do. And he wants to lead. Listen, he wants to give you direction more than you want to receive direction. And number four, and I'll be through. Here's the fourth thing. Here's the best part. He says, when you get blessing of forgiveness, you get one word, you get the loving kindness of God. Look in chapter 32 and notice verses 10 through 11. He says, many are the sorrows of the wicked. Now let's stop right there just a moment. Now what does he mean by that? You only have three problems today that fall into three general classifications. Listen carefully. You know what they are? You only got three problems. Sin, sorrow, and death. Every problem you have can be classified into sin, sorrow, and death. Now, if you can find one more, friend, I'm going to add it to my sermon. That's all we got. But he says, many are the sorrows. Does, does that mean the wicked has more sorrows than the believer? No. That's not what he means. Notice the next phrase. But he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Here's what he means. Both the wicked and the believer have problems. God reigns on the just and the unjust. Sorrows come to the just and unjust. But those who are in sin don't have the loving kindness along with their sorrows. But those who know the Lord Jesus Christ have loving kindness. Now, I want you to do a Hebrew study sometime and go back and find how many times the word loving kindness is used in the Old Testament. Friend, in the balcony, it is all the way through Scripture. Psalms 23, verse 6. 
Loving kindness shall follow me, what? All the days of my life. You'll find that word all the way. What does it mean? It means lenient mercy. Lenient mercy. Here's what it means. It means whatever comes in my life, sin, sorrow, judgment, death, pain, loss of a loved one, loss of a child, whatever comes in my life, he said there is lubrication on the track of life. There is God's loving kindness with you. Now, one of the advantages of being a pastor is I've seen a lot of people in a lot of grief. And I want you to know something. Not only experientially, but, but watching people go through all kinds of things. I, you know, I've not been a grandparent that lost a child drowned, but I've sat with one. Uh, I, I've not been a parent who lost a child, but I've sat with those. I, I've not been a spouse who lost a spouse, but I've sat with those. And, and I found this verse really works, that when you are walking forgiven... You see, it's more than just knowing Jesus, but walking in connection with God, loving kindness affects everything that you do. Sorrow, God's there. Death, God's there. Uh, Joe Barron called the church this past week. I called him back. Many of you remember his father-in-law, Mike Gilchrist, Cheryl's dad. Mike preached two revivals here. Well, Mike's wife, Donnie, is at the point of death. She contracted cancer two years ago. We prayed for her. And Israel, we were together when they first found it. And, and, and Joe came and called me to say, look, tell the church that Donnie's at the very gate of death. Her kidneys are shut down. And, and, and we don't know any day she could go, any moment. They've given us about two days. But then he said this. He said, you know, our family's here. You know how much we love this dear lady. And she's been a blessing in the hospital. The, the nurses just love her and they're sorrowful. But he said, I want you to know, the presence of God is so strong. And then he quoted First Thessalonians 4.13. He says, we do not grieve as those who have no hope. And, and I thought about that loving kindness that, you see, those who know the Lord grieve differently than those who don't know the Lord. And what he's saying is, you really can't lose. Because when you're walking forgiven, there's nothing that can pain you. There's nothing that comes into your life. If death comes, God is there. If sin comes, he's faithful and just to forgive my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. When I cleanse myself through the power of Jesus Christ and Jesus cleanses me, I confess and get that wonderful repentance. If judgment comes. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I can stand in judgment and say, because of Jesus I have full victory. And guess what happens? Listen, when you begin to realize this, don't, don't miss this part, please. When you realize the blessing of all the benefits that we have here, did you hear them? When I'm forgiven through Jesus, I'm released from guilt. I'm connected with God. I'm directed by God. And then I have the loving kindness of God. He said, when you do that, something's going to happen to you. It's verse 11. He says, when you receive forgiveness, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones. Oh, by the way, there's something else in verse 7, last phrase, you'll want to sing. Thou dost surround me with songs of deliverance. Uh, do you know how we know from the platform who's forgiven? Those that are singing. They didn't say you have to sound good, just make a joyful noise. Oh, praise God, praise God. Does that sound great? All right. Doesn't sound great, but you can still sing. Amen. Look at last phrase of verse 11. One thing I can do. He says, shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. You say, well, don't turn into a Pentecostal. No, I'm just a biblicist. That's what the Bible says. He says, when you are forgiven in God, you can't help but let somebody know about it. Because you realize how much it's worth. Now, let me ask you a question this morning. I suppose that under your chair, we left a raffle number. And we're going to raffle off a 2002 Navigator car this morning. It's been revised, that car. And it's sitting out in the parking lot. And number 13 wins. And you pull under your seat. And you're the number 13. What you going to do? Well, you're going to jump up and say, hip, hip, hooray, zippity. And you're going to run through the lobby. Woo! They're going to say, what happened to him? Did he get saved? No, I just want a Navigator. <laughs> and you couldn't contain it. You go home, you call your mom and your daddy, your brother, your sister too. And you say, let me tell you what happened to me. And it could happen to you. Go to that church. Number 13 is a lucky number. Oh, you get so excited? <laughs> He's saying, listen, you've got something better than a navigator. You've got forgiveness. You've got forgiveness. You've been released from guilt. You've been connected from God, with God, and you're connected and you're led by God. And the loving kindness of God walks with you. You see, that, that, that's the secret of forgiving others. That's why Jesus said, forgive us our debts as what? As we forgive those who trespass against us. That's why Jesus said, if you don't forgive others, you can't sense the forgiveness of God. That's why he said that. That's why a young 10-year-old boy who was taken away from his home and stabbed with an ice pick in Florida and shot in the back of the head and blinded. 
later found and survived that attack. And Chris Carey became a youth director at a church in Florida. About two years ago, he found out who did that terrible crime. A 77-year-old invalid now in a nursing home. The statute of limitations had passed. He was not in jail. And Chris Carrier found the man who confessed the crime that happened to him years before. I wish you could see the picture that I saw of Chris Carrier walking into the room and ministering to that man who had shot him and stabbed him with an ice pick. He didn't go one time. He went a second time, another time, another time. And finally, that man by the name of David McAllister received Jesus as Savior and Lord. And somebody said to Chris, Chris, how could you forgive somebody that did that to you? And here's what he said. He said, while many people can't understand how I could forgive David McAllister from my point of view, I could not forgive him. Then I wouldn't be the man God has helped me to be. That's Psalms 32. That's Psalms 32. When you and I receive the forgiveness of God, we can't contain the joy of God and we automatically forgive those. There's somebody maybe that you need to forgive. Statistics are that one out of nine ladies are molested growing up. Is there some lady here today that needs to forgive your dad, your stepdad? How about in business? Somebody did you wrong in business and maybe cheated you out of something? Maybe somebody in this church at home, do you need to forgive somebody? Well, if you realize what God has done for you, then you'll want to forgive them too. I saw Franklin Graham on television this week, the son of Billy Graham. He's written a new book called The Name. I went to the bookstore yesterday to get the book. Couldn't find it. So I walked up to the counter. I said, sir, could you look up a book for me? He said, what's the name? I said, the name. <laughs> he said, it comes out, but it's not out yet. It comes out August 6th. Need to get the book. Franklin Graham tells the true story in South Jordan of a Bedouin family who had a young son who was out playing with another young boy. They were playing rather roughly and the young boy accidentally killed his friend. He ran from the scene. You see, in Bedouin society, the moray is if you do something equally, it should be done to you. You punch somebody's eye out, they punch your eye. You kill somebody, you get killed. But there's another tradition the young boy knew that if he ran to the tent peg of someone's tent and grabbed hold of the tent peg and received asylum and they took him into the tent, he was to be protected. So the young boy ran. He ran up to a tent. He grabbed the tent peg. A man walked out with a white beard. He told the man what had happened. The man said, come in my tent. About that time a mob came up, they had rocks. And they yelled to the old man and they said, let him out, let him out, let him out of that tent. We're gonna kill him, he killed that young boy. He said, I will not, let him out. I'm protecting him, he said. And finally somebody from the crowd said, but you don't understand, the young boy who was killed is your son. The old man, pensive for a moment, waited. And then he said, then I will adopt him as my son. And he did. My friends, that's exactly what Jesus Christ did for you and me. When Jesus died, you and I killed him, and God adopts you and Jesus to be his son. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. And I want to have some release from guilt, please. No one's leaving. No one's turning around. We can have a breakthrough today. And right now, I'm going to ask you to just lift your heart up to God. There's some here today that need to receive the forgiveness of your salvation and ask Jesus to come into your life. There are others here that need to say, God, help me to forgive my dad, my mother, my friend, my son, my daughter, whoever it is, my employer, my employee. Would you get that right now with God, right with God? Just tell God right now. And then thirdly, maybe there's somebody grappling with a decision, maybe to join the church, be baptized, to give your heart to Christ. I don't know what it is. But we're going to ask God's favor on you right now. And we're going to ask you to release to God that which he's putting on your heart. We mean business. We're not playing games. God means business. We're talking life and death. A school teacher went to the board one day trying to emphasize the shortness of life and she wrote down the number 25,500. The children says, what does that mean? She said, that's the number of days you have to live if you live 70 years of age. And suddenly the children realized how short life is. But you know what, 25,500 days is a long time if you're unforgiven. It's a long time to live unforgiven. But compared to eternity, life is a short time. And eternity is even a longer time to live unforgiven forever and ever. But you know what? You can live this life, 25,500 days, whatever your number is, might be less, might be 5,000 days, might be 10,000. You can live forgiven and then live forever forgiven in Jesus. Don't you want him to come to your life? Don't you want to say right now, just pray a prayer. Dear God, just pray the prayer. Dear God, forgive my sins. 
Lord Jesus, come into my life. Pray the prayer. Forgive my sins. Come into my life. Save me. Be my Lord and Savior. I trust in Jesus. And then, Christian, you just pray to him and say, Lord, cleanse me today. Put your finger on my sin and cleanse me. And I want you to walk out of this hall, into that lobby, into the parking lot, into your home, free today. And you can be free. Others making decisions, just a moment, we're going to have an invitation. You're going to stand. You're going to come. Some coming to join the church, some on baptism, some moving your letter, whatever it is. Some on profession of faith. Father, we thank you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. As we stand, as we sing, we invite you to come. Go to the nearest aisle. Come down the front. Our pastors wait for you. Our encouragers come. Once you come from the balcony on the first stanza, as we sing, once you come. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. Once you come, God bless you. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. I want you just to bow your head and close your eyes. Some have come to the altar. And I want you to give Kim Fawcett the microphone. I want Kim to pray a short prayer. Kim, I just sense there's some decisions. There are people praying for other people, people praying for themselves. And sometimes we leave people at the altar and forget some of the prayers. But this is representative of the whole church. Others are praying. Lead us in a short prayer. And maybe there's someone here today that has another step they need to make. Would you lead us in that prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do pause before you this morning, Lord realizing the great sacrifice that you've made for us. Father, you have forgiven us of our sins. Lord, you displayed that on the cross. Father, you gave the ultimate sacrifice in your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we can do no less than to forgive those who have wronged us. Father, than to offer up the forgiveness of, to you of sins in our own lives. God, the things that we know displease you the things that we know are, are not right in our own lives. But Lord, for some reason we hang on to them and we enjoy them. And Father, we just pray now that uh, in this moment of, of meditation, in this time of, of contemplating your word, Lord, that you would release us from those sins. And Father, that we would come before you, humbly bow and forgive and ask forgiveness of those sins. And we just ask that to happen right now in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Kim. Some have gone.